Good afternoon to all of you joining us here in New York, and welcome to all of our guests from around the world. I'm Steve Altman, director of the DHL Initiative on Globalization here at NYU Stern's Center for the Future of Management. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this event and my honor to introduce our guest, NBA Africa CEO, Victor Williams. As CEO of NBA Africa, Williams oversees the NBA's basketball and business development across the continents through grassroots development, media distribution, corporate partnerships, the growth of Basketball League Africa, and more. Prior to joining the NBA in 2020, Williams served for five years as the executive head of corporate and investment banking Africa regions for Standard Bank Group. He holds an MBA from Harvard Business School and bachelor's degrees in applied math and economics from Brown University. Mr. Williams will discuss basketball in Africa and the NBA's growth strategy in the region with NYU Stern professor Cinciana Dorobantu. Professor Dorobantu is a professor in NYU Stern's Department of Management and Organizations, where her research focuses on international business, strategic management, and political economy. Before turning the floor over to our speakers, I would just like to mention that the format of today's event is a fireside chat in which Professor Dorobantu will start by asking Mr. Mr. Williams a series of questions. Then she will turn to questions from the audience. Please feel free to submit questions throughout the event using the Zoom Q&A function. And Professor Dorobantu will pose as many of your questions as our time permits to Mr. Williams. Without further ado then, Professor Dorobantu, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Steve. Mr. Williams, thank you so much for joining us today. We are delighted to welcome you to NYU Stern, if only virtually right now, and delighted to have a chance to learn about and learn from your experience leading the NBA on the African continent. You took on this challenge in mid-2020 and have been working hard to grow the sport in that part of the world. To get us started, can you please talk to us about the reasons why the NBA has embarked on this journey to grow basketball as a sport and the NBA as a professional league in Africa? Thank you, uh, Professor Dorobantu, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's great to be uh, here today and part of this session. Uh, so the NBA, um, as I think many people are aware, has been focused on globalization of our game for many, many years. Uh, and we were really amongst the first North American uh, sports leagues to uh, spread, um, actively and intentionally spread our game across, across the world. Um, Africa has, has been a part of the NBA's uh, activities uh, for several years, um, uh, going back to uh, the late, really the late 1960s, uh, when NBA players such as uh, Bill Russell first started to journey to the continent. Uh, we've, uh, uh, our former uh, commissioner, uh, David Stern, visited President Mandela, um, even before South Africa gained its uh, democracy uh, to talk about. Um, uh, how sports could help to transform lives on the continent and to lay the foundation for activities on the continent uh, through pioneers such as Akeem Olajuwon and uh, Dikembe Mutombo and Manute Bol. Uh, Africans have been introduced to the NBA uh, and those players have performed with great distinction. And so, um, you know, we've been uh, focused on growing our activities on the continent uh, for several years. We opened an office in Johannesburg in 2010. Um, and uh, after uh, a decade of activities, we recently decided to expand the scope of what we do on the continent. And we see Africa as a place, um, as a very attractive market uh, for our game. We see it as a uh, source of great talent uh, uh, for basketball going forward. Uh, but we also want to uh, reach into and tap African consumers as well and African youth uh, and get them to become fans of our game. And we also see basketball as a vehicle for delivering social and economic impact on the continent. And what motivated you to take on this challenge when you agreed to step into the role of CEO of MBA Africa? For me, two things stand out in this decision. First, the fact that you came from a very different industry before you worked in banking, most recently at South Africa Standard Bank, as Steve mentioned in his introduction. 
And second, that you agreed to take on this assignment in mid-2020, when the world was facing one of the most uncertain times in history. So if we could take you back to that moment in time, what were some of the most important things that influenced your decision? Well, um, it, it was in fact a very interesting time to make a, a career shift. Um, I'd been working in banking for, um, you know, about a couple of decades and uh, on the African continent for uh, about uh, uh, nine years uh, with Standard Bank helping to grow the corporate and investment banking business across the continent. Um, so um, I've always had a passion for Africa. Uh, this is the continent where I was born and grew up uh, for growing strong, successful uh, businesses on the continent. And I did that uh, as an advisor to corporates. I did that as, uh, as a leader of the banking business. And so one of the things that attracted me to um, to the NBA was that um, uh, the league had a very clear vision for growth in Africa and was looking for someone to lead and spearhead that growth. And that was a challenge that I found uh, exciting. I think another factor uh, that was interesting for me was that I have been a sports fan and an NBA fan for many, many years uh, myself. Uh, I've had a lot of uh, respect for the league and admiration for uh, its um, its uh, uh, activities uh, growing the game around the globe, and um, so the opportunity to join the league and um, and uh, and and lead its activities in Africa was also very interesting. The conversations I was having with the league started actually before COVID, uh, and I was uh, uh, really in the middle of the interview process when we went into. Uh, lockdown here in South Africa and around the world. Uh, but we did go ahead and complete um, the uh, the hiring process. And I did make the decision to join because I think both the league and I were really focused on the long-term uh, vision for uh, what uh, the NBA was looking to achieve on the continent. And I knew that that vision would survive uh, regardless of, of the pandemic. Uh, I don't think any of us anticipated that the pandemic would last as long as it did, uh, but uh, I'm glad I made the choice uh, uh, even uh, during the pandemic. So can you talk, talk to us a little bit more about that vision and the strategy that the NBA has adopted for uh, NBA Africa? When you're thinking about growing the sport across the continent, do you think about growing it equally across the 54 countries uh, on this continent? Do you try to launch programs in all the countries around the same time? Or do you experiment in parts of the continent to see what works well, what works less well, and then decide whether to expand these programs elsewhere? Um, so as uh, I think many of your viewers know, Africa is, uh, is an extremely large continent with 54 countries um, and our vision is about growing the game on the continent from a basketball perspective as well as from a commercial perspective and a fan engagement perspective. And so um, um, what that means is creating more opportunities at the grassroots for young people to learn the game and to build out a pathway that enables them to pursue their passion for the sport uh, from a young age all the way to the professional level. And we've started a professional league on the continent, the Basketball Africa League, which is now entering its uh, third season. Uh, we want to grow our fan base on the continent uh, and get many more Africans to be fans of the NBA and to be engaged uh, with our teams, our players, um, uh, and, uh, um, and everything about the NBA, uh, the whole culture and lifestyle that surrounds the NBA in as many ways as possible. And we want to grow uh, from a commercial perspective in terms of uh, the distribution of our media rights, our content, our merchandise and uh, footwear and apparel um, and, and other commercial active and our sponsorships, et cetera, on the continent. Um, we know we can't bite off uh, the whole continent at one time. And mm -hmm. so we've identified a number of what we call sort of priority uh, markets uh, across the continent where we will focus the bulk of our time and our attention. And in some of these markets, uh, you've seen us open 
this already. Uh, so South Africa is the country where we have, uh, we've been headquartered uh, since 20. We have an office in uh, Senegal, a few that is the headquarters of Basketball Africa League. In uh, February of 22, we opened an office in League of Nigeria. Uh, January of this year, we had an office in Cairo, Egypt. Um, so that speaks to some of these markets that we view as our markets and markets where we at the same time we have talent and opportunities everywhere. And so we will also optimistically uh, uh, be active in certain countries uh, in circumstances not together make sense for us to do that. So do you see, you mentioned a number of countries um, just now, do you see those as launch pads for the regions in which they are themselves located? Or for now, they're just sort of the markets that you're for, focusing on your priority markets, just, just that? So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's I think, um, for the for the sake of efficiency, they all have some degree of regional. Um, um, they all act, act somewhat as regional hubs, but we actually first and foremost make the decision based on our belief in that country and um, from both a basketball and a commercial perspective. And do the circumstances exist uh, for us? To, to set up an office there. Um, and so the country rationale has to make sense. And then if that works, we can then serve, um, you know, um, uh, some adjacent countries uh, from, that, um, from, that, from that country office. Switching gears a little bit, can you tell us or talk to us about some of the programs that the NBA has developed um, in these different markets and their results so far? Yeah, so I would say, um, um, as I mentioned, one one of the things, the the pillars of our strategy is growing out opportunities for young people to play the game um, and to be exposed to it. So one of the ways we do this is through our junior NBA programs, which uh, enable kids from the ages of say eight through to fourteen. Uh, to play the game in a structured environment uh, with great coaching uh, uh, and a combination of clinics and, and league play. Uh, today, we do junior NBA con uh, programs in more than 15 countries around, uh, around the continent, and uh, we're reaching uh, millions of kids at this point, both directly and indirectly, uh, through our, our activities in junior NBA. One of our largest junior NBA programs uh, is here in South Africa. I'm speaking to you from Johannesburg. We've been doing a program with the Royal Bafokeng Nation uh, here for uh, more than 12 years, uh, which has been very successful. And we also have a great program uh, that we do with ExxonMobil in uh, Abuja, Nigeria. So those are two of our longest standing uh, junior NBA programs, but we have several others around the continent. Another initiative uh, we have in terms of building up the pathway is an NBA academy. Uh, so we started uh, an NBA academy in Senegal uh, that takes 24 of the most promising uh, African youth and uh, young players and puts them you know, in an environment where they can continue their education and get high level training in basketball. We're starting to see graduates of our academy move on to play uh, high-level Division One basketball in the U.S., and some are uh, going directly into the professional ranks with uh, the G League uh, Ignite, uh, which is part of the NBA's development uh, pathway. And um, and then I would say the Basketball Africa League is at the uh, pinnacle of that um, uh, development pathway. Uh, we started the BAL in 2020 uh, um, as the premier. Uh, club competition for professional players on the continent and have been really pleased with how it's grown and developed over the first uh, three years of its existence. 
Um, this is wonderful. It's really, really, really great to hear um, all that. And we know that uh, the potential for growing a business, any business really in Africa is just enormous, but so are some of the challenges. So I, you know, as you're thinking about the program that you mentioned or any others that you have now ongoing, uh, can you talk to us about what you see as the main challenges of growing the NBA League in Africa? Uh, well, our job is to overcome the challenges. <laughs> I'll talk about <laughs> um, about about some of those. Um, so, I think at the when we think about growing the game and growing participation for the game on the continent, infrastructure is a is a key issue. Um, uh, you know, basketball requires relatively little to play, but it does require a court, uh, a hoop, and a ball. And um, there's still too few of those on the continent. And so we've been uh, engaged in a program of building courts and encouraging our partners and other people in the basketball ecosystem uh, to build uh, courts on the continent so that kids can have an opportunity uh, to play. Um, it, the challenge with infrastructure also extends all the way to the professional level. We have relatively few world-class arenas, indoor arenas on the continent. And so as we grow a professional league, um, part of um, uh, what determines our rate of growth is really the how quickly um, uh, arenas can be built that will be able to host our games and enable us to provide the viewing experience, the fan experience, and indeed the player experience that we want to associate uh, with our brand. Um, the, you know, on the distribution side, Africa is uh, quite a fragmented market. Um, uh, so, um, you know, if you're looking to distribute uh, television content, uh, there are myriad players uh, that one has to deal with uh, to serve the various countries and the various language groups uh, on, on the continent. Um, as we grow our, you know, merchandise uh, business on the continent, um, we're, you know, tackling the issue of uh, distribution and working with various, um, you know, logistics companies and uh, uh, to facilitate e-commerce uh, across the continent um, so that our fans can, you know, shop online and get uh, access to, to our goods. So, these are all challenges that um, are part of doing business on the continent. They're not necessarily specific to the NBA, uh, but uh, we're working with partners and learning from other industries uh, and coming up with ideas for surmounting these and other challenges. So I'd love to ask you a little bit more about how you work with partners, right? L local partnerships are essential, um, but also they take quite a, Quite a bit of time to build, right? So uh, I'd like to ask you two questions about that. First, can you share some examples of how you build these partnerships in different parts of the continent? And second, how do you balance the investments and time required to grow and empower local partners and the desire to make the NBA Africa and the Basketball Africa League a, su a success as soon as possible? So I, I think one of the things that's true in Africa and make, it's probably true elsewhere as well is the value of long-term uh, relationships um, and um, identifying people that have a shared vision for uh, what one is trying to do. Um, and so if I take, for example, the partnership that we have with the Royal Bafokeng Nation in South Africa, as I said, that's been 12 years of, of uh, in existence. We've worked hand in hand to start with a fledgling program that reached just a few schools and kids uh, in the Northwest province of South Africa to a program that today uh, reaches, I think approximately 40 schools uh, across uh, the province, um, involves hundreds of, you know, uh, thousands of kids, hundreds of of uh, teachers and coaches, um, and and it's uh, it's really been built on uh, the shared vision, the shared commitment, and the willingness to 
um, do great things together um, and talk through the challenges that are, arise um, uh, from time to time. Um, and those are, it's an example of the kind of partnership that we want to build with, with uh, you know, um, uh, as, we, as, as we grow the game on the continent. In terms of um, empowering uh, some of the, the local partners, I would say in the BAL uh, in particular, our goal is to um, deliver a product and an experience that is world class. And we firmly believe that Africa is and can be uh, world class. And so um, if I take, for example, the shifts we've made from season one of the BAL to where we are today heading into season three. In season one, we relied uh, pretty significantly on US and international partners that the NBA had worked with in many, many circumstances and places to put on, you know, our global games and other events to assist us. Um, and what we've done um, uh, from the beginning is to integrate African partners into uh, roles alongside those international partners. And as we've gone, um, uh, progressed in the league, the African partners have taken on more and more of the responsibility for running um, uh, aspects of, of the league and partnering with us. And we believe that that is ultimately more sustainable. Um, it's actually more cost effective uh, and it enables us to uh, create um, the, you know, the, the environment of excellence uh, around sports on the continent that benefits not just us, but other um, participants in the ecosystem that are trying to uh, to execute world-class programs on the continent. Mm. So building on that, um, I'm just wondering, how do you, how do you think about measuring progress and how do you define success for NBA Africa right now? And maybe if I can add to that, like five to 10 years from now. So, I mean, we have near-term and, <laughs> and long-term, uh, 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 metrics, um, I think um, you know we we look at a at a at a few key things based on the various businesses that we're running, and we're in some ways running multiple businesses on the continent. So, for example, uh, grassroots uh, programs we measure by the number of young people that we're reaching um, across the continent, and we have a particular focus on um also the participation of young, of girls and young women in our program um uh we want uh basketball on the continent to be gender inclusive and so we actively track what percentage um of girls and young women are participating in our programs in our um elite uh programs like our academy uh we're keeping an eye on how many of the young uh, men are making their way to either high level division one programs or uh, eventually uh, into the professional ranks, either with the, the BAL or, or maybe someday with the NBA. Uh, for the BAL, we look at viewership, um, we look at fan engagement, we look at social media engagement, um, and across all our programs, because uh, we have commercial goals as well. We're looking at uh, what we're generating in terms of revenue and partnership and sponsorship uh, activities as well. Uh, so you just said that you're you're tracking how many how many how much of the talent from uh, from the different programs that you're running, uh, how how many players go to Division One or uh, NBA teams. Uh, so. Is there is there a risk that do you see that as a good outcome? It sounds like you do, right? But there's is there a risk that NBA Africa and the Basketball Africa League will become mainly a pipeline uh, for established teams elsewhere? Or how do you think about the trade-offs of seeing like, great players being recognized worldwide and the goal of establishing and continuing to grow the league on the continent? Our first priority is to have a league that is sustainable on the continent and provides opportunities for as many young African players to um, fulfill their dreams uh, 
uh, if they want to be professional in Africa. Um, and so the growth of our leagues to the point where it provides, you know, a, a place, you know, a, a long and successful career for African players in Africa uh, is our first goal for the Basketball Africa League. Having said that, if we generate the kind and, and develop the kinds of players that we think we will, there will always be some group that uh, have the ability to play in the NBA, and we would love to see them go on and fulfill their potential uh, at the NBA level as they can. So with, with the big plans that you have in mind, you're essentially trying to bring about cultural change. And you once said, and I lo absolutely love this quote, that you want the first instinct of African kids when they see a ball to be to bounce it rather than kick it. So today, soccer is king among the fans and the as aspiring players in many countries around the world, including on the African continent. So how do you imagine bringing basketball at least at the same level as soccer as a sport in Africa? Well, you know, I believe that one should set uh, lofty goals, um, but I think the, 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 the beauty of that um, conception of what we're trying to do is that it also points the road to how we can succeed, which is making the game accessible at an early age to as many African youth as possible. And what we believe is that if we do that, they're gonna love uh, being exposed to basketball. They're gonna enjoy playing it with their friends. They're gonna want to play it you know, for the rest of their lives. And they're gonna become fans, fans of the game. Um, we're not competing with soccer, um, uh, but we think that there is a lot of opportunity and a lot of momentum for basketball on the continent. And if uh, we wake up every day trying to figure out how we can make basketball bigger um, and more popular on the continent and more accessible, and if we do all the things that we see in front of us, we think over the time we will convert, or not just convert, we will enable many, many more Africans to be basketball fans and players. And they can continue being soccer fans and players also. It's not an either or uh, kind of situation. You mentioned uh, a moment ago that you want the sport um, to be gender inclusive on the continent. And I'd love to hear from you how the NBA Africa or how the NBA more broadly is involved with the development of women's basketball on the continent. Yeah, so um, I would say, as I said, for us um, as a league, um, as I think people know, um, you know, we, the WNBA has recently celebrated its 25th uh, anniversary and it's, um, you know, uh, as probably more successful and, and better known and followed than ever before. And I think as a league, we're very proud of what our colleagues at the WNBA have been able to, to, to achieve. Um, and so we see and believe in the opportunity for women's basketball in Africa. Um, it has to begin at the junior, at, at the grassroots level, which is why we're focused on this goal of having um, eventually uh, uh, equal representation of boys and, and girls um, in our junior programs. But it goes beyond that. It also extends to uh, training of um, uh, women um, in uh, various, uh, um, call it authority roles in basketball. Uh, so that's uh, as coaches, as referees, uh, as administrators, it involves um, identifying talented young uh, girls, um, and giving them the opportunity to hone their game at the elite level. Uh, we have a program where um, we uh, bring uh, young women from around the continent to spend time at the NBA Academy uh, and be coached by uh, WNBA uh, coaches and players and, and, and NBA Africa staff. Um, and, um, and, and one of the things that we're really proud about at the BAL is the opportunities that um, 
we've created together with our partner FIBA for women uh, referees uh, to um, um, officiate uh, men's professional games, uh, to be uh, game commissioners, um, and to take on um, uh, positions of, of authority within the league. Um, and I also must uh, mention uh, that we're really proud uh, to have a, a female coach, uh, Liz Mills, who's um, coached uh, uh, two teams uh, in the Basketball Africa League um, uh, last year and, and again this year. Oh, that's wonderful. I, in just a moment, I will open it up to questions from our audience. So with that in mind, I'd like to encourage uh, everyone who's, jo who's joined us here to submit questions through the Q&A function on our webinar. And I will select from these questions and pass them on to, to Mr. Williams. But before we open it up to questions from our students and other members of the audience, I would like to ask you to reflect on your experience as CEO of NBA Africa so far. So what is what was or what is the most surprising thing that you discovered in this role? And if you don't mind sharing, what was one of the most important moments for you in this leadership position? Hmm. Um, so look, I mean, I think, um, I mean, a, a couple of, of things really uh, stand out. Um, I would say one internal and one external. I think on the internal side is, um, being within the NBA, um, I've just been blown away by how much work and dedication it takes to put on uh, games and events, um, and especially starting this uh, Basketball Africa League um, uh, and the hard work that it takes to think through, plan, execute every aspect of running uh, this league or, or, or other events. And just the sheer expertise that has been built up over several years within the organization uh, and the willingness of colleagues all across the, the world to pitch in and help uh, and give up their uh, time and their uh, knowledge to ensure that we in Africa are successful. Uh, that um, has really sort of blown me away. I think the second thing um, that I'll touch on, which is external, is uh, the power of the NBA brand and the power of sports. Uh, and what I mean by that is um, um, the NBA brand resonates in a really particular uh, and interesting way globally. Uh, people have strong positive associations with it. Uh, people are excited about the league and our players and, and what we're doing around the world. Um, and um, uh, those lead to really positive conversation about partnership opportunities and things that we can do uh, together. Um, and I, I think it's one of the things I tell our new team members as they join is uh, you'll be blown away by the power of this brand that you associated with uh, and, and how uh, positively people respond to it. That's wonderful. Thank you for, for sharing that. So turning to our audience, questions from the audience, one of them is asking you to, if you could reflect on your relationship with the national leagues, some of the teams that play uh, in the Basketball Africa League, also play in their own domestic leagues. Is there a tension there? Is there just maybe only potential for collaboration? And why do you think it makes sense to make this a uh, continental sport rather than an intra-country or regional uh, league? Thanks for the question. Um, so when we started the Basketball Africa League, uh, we did so in collaboration and in partnership with FIBA, which is the, um, the Federation of International Basketball Associations, the world governing body for, for basketball. And in particular, we've worked very closely with the FIBA Africa office uh, here uh, on the continent. And so in designing this um, competition as a continental uh, championship, that involves existing club teams 
who qualify by winning their domestic competitions, we've actually designed it to be very complementary to the existing uh, domestic competitions. Uh, and now the prize of playing in the BAL, which only the champion of that national league gets to gets to gets to do, is something that is causing teams to invest more in building up their capabilities and in competing harder in their domestic leagues, so they can have the opportunity to play in the BAL. And we see the BAL as helping to lift the level of basketball ecosystem you know, across the continent. Uh, and so all of that work is being done closely in collaboration with FIBA Africa. Monique is asking you if you can expand a little bit on the NBA's Africa digital strategy. How is it enabled by in sort of the increased use of smartphones and streaming on the continent? And where do you see it expanding? So, I mean, this is one of the things uh, that we're most excited about on the continent. Um, and I would say, first of all, as a league uh, globally, um, the digital, I guess, tra transition, if you, were, if you would, or the digital opportunity is one of our key, um, you know, priority areas. Um, I mean, in, in North America, uh, I think many of the, of the participants uh, on this webinar, we'll be familiar with the shift towards streaming away from traditional uh, uh, linear uh, television, broadcast television, and in fact, uh, from cable television as well. In Africa, there's a somewhat different dynamic in that, uh, you know, the mobile phone really took off uh, and became ubiquitous in Africa to fill in the gaps that existed uh, with the absence of, of fixed uh, telephone lines, and so many Africans own, you know, most Africans own at least one and many own two and sometimes three uh, mobile phones. So we see mobile phones as a key distribution platform for our content going forward, and we're engaged in discussions with many of the telcos about how we can, we can do this. Having said this, this is all still at a relatively early stage of development on the continent. Um, the distribution of, of content uh, through the mobile phone. So everyone's figuring out what are the right platforms to use, what are the right payment mechanisms, um, uh, how we deal with challenges relating to bandwidth and cost of data. So we're, we're all, uh, it's an exciting time uh, where we're, I think, all experimenting and trying a number of different uh, options. Uh, to, 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 to better um, uh, tap into the opportunity that, that we see ahead of us. Taking you from digital strategy to infrastructure, uh, Tino Ada refers back to your comments on infrastructure being a challenge in Africa and is asking you, how, what are you doing specifically to overcome that challenge? Uh, I would say one, we're building as many courts as we can, <laughs> as quickly as we can. Uh, but we also know that um, the, 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 the work is large. And so we are um, engaging partners to come alongside us and to, um, to, to walk this uh, path and this journey uh, with us and to achieve the vision together. Um, so, um, uh, um, uh, that is one of the concrete things we're doing. Uh, another thing that we're doing is uh, lending our support to, um, you know, organizations uh, that are looking to build uh, arenas on the continent. Um, and so uh, through, um, um, you know, uh, discussions that we participated in and, and um, and, and were a part of, um, you know, we were supportive of uh, um, uh, Senegal uh, building a world-class arena in Dakar, which is one of the places where we'll play uh, the BAL uh, games uh, starting actually on Saturday. Um, uh, Rwanda built a world-class arena in Kigali, 
where we'll play BL again in uh, May, uh, the uh, playoffs and the final. And we're aware of other initiatives around the continent to build world-class arenas in other cities, and we're helping to support those um, so that the, um, the, the consortia that are working on these um, you know, can understand how uh, these arenas could someday um, be uh, places that could host BAL games or other forms of NBA activity on the continent, and that can factor into, into their business plans uh, going forward. And I think this is also a wonderful example of your work contributing to broader economic development uh, in different parts of the continent. Building on that question, on that, on that comment, I'd like to, uh, Abhi is asking you, how do you ensure that the growth of NBA Africa and any bis related business development initiatives benefit the local communities in which sort of the teams are embedded uh, and of course, economic development in the regions where, where this is happening? Yeah, so, I mean, that is, that is um, a key focus area for us in everything we do. As I said before, as much as possible, we want to work with local partners um, in, in, in our activities uh, here on the continent uh, to ensure that our activities translate into, um, into economic benefit uh, to people on the continent. Um, we um, do a number uh, social impact is, is really uh, um, a big for us. Um, and so we're partnering with a number of um, uh, social equity uh, organizations around the continent in running programs that especially reach a lot, a lot of young people. Um, uh, I, I think that, um, you know, We've done some training programs for uh, young people to expose them to careers in sport um, and to help them understand the opportunities that are available for them. Um, we uh, run a number, uh, just about to kick off in our South African office, an internship program for young people so that they can spend time as part of our team and, and, and learn. Uh, from us, um, um, you know, uh, uh, from the inside, so to speak. Um, and so uh, um, as we, as we uh, execute our, very, our various programs, we're always looking for opportunities uh, to work primarily uh, with local uh, talent um, and, uh, and local uh, entities uh, to grow their capabilities on the continent and to give them the opportunity to participate in our value stream, so to speak. Alexis is asking you, uh, what are the biggest similarities between your current role and your previous role at the Standard Bank Group? So where, what are the areas in, you can, in which you can leverage the pre your previous experience the most? Uh, you know, a number of different ways. Um, I think, first of all, business is business. Um, so one of the things I did in my prior roles was, you know, lead uh, banking businesses. So thinking about revenue, or expenses, uh, use of capital, uh, human resources, deploying the right people into the right roles, um, uh, motivating, incentivizing, uh, thinking about strategy and execution. So the context is different, but many of those building blocks and fundamentals show up uh, in my current job. I think um, one of the things that has proven to be really helpful is the experience I developed uh, running businesses across the continent while I was at Standard Bank. Uh, so with Standard Bank, I lived in uh, Kenya for a while and ran businesses across East Africa. I lived in Nigeria. Uh, and then um, I also have lived in South Africa now for many years and ran businesses across uh, 19 different countries on the continent and helped start new uh, standard bank entities in uh, three different countries. Um, so when it comes to 
um, you know, operating in many of the markets in which we, we do. Um, I have some familiarity with most of them, uh, relationships in many of them. And, um, and that then just complements the relationships and the knowledge that our team already has from the decade of work that had been going on uh, with our office uh, here even before I joined. A number of questions are actually asking you if you could share a little bit about how you're working with headquarters. To what extent is MBA Africa independent of the overall MBA organization in terms of thinking about growth strategy, regional uh, strategy across the continent, or how much do you have to sort of um, uh, rely on, on, on headquarters to, to move forward in different with different parts of your, your strategy? Um, so we're very much a part of the, of the MBA. Um, uh, my uh, Mark Tatum, who's the deputy commissioner and who and CEO of the MBA uh, and leads all of our uh, international activities, uh, is my direct boss. Um, and uh, we meet as an international leadership team every week uh, to talk about our businesses across, um, you know, all the various markets around the globe in which we operate. Um, we, as I said before, um, in talking about uh, running, uh, starting the Basketball Africa League, we drew heavily, especially in uh, the first year, on the expertise of NBA colleagues from around the world who'd done this before um, in starting the G League and the WNBA, uh, had worked with various teams, but also in that particular circumstance had been part of the NBA uh, running the bubble uh, during COVID um, uh, in, at, at Disney World in Orlando. And we did a bubble in our first season in Kigali. So there were lots of direct learnings uh, from that. Having said that, um, we have a quite specific strategy for Africa, like we do for all of our international regions that is specific to the opportunities that we see in that region. Um, we have our own you know, budgets uh, um, and resources to build our team um, and to execute on that strategy. Um, and, um, and, and we have, you know, I would say uh, flexibility and uh, autonomy to make a lot of decisions um, that will help us drive the strategy, while at the same time recognizing that we are part of a global organization with a global reputation and that anything and everything that we do has the potential to, you know, both enhance but also reverberate back to the NBA. And so, uh, we have to be compliant with the NBA's global standards as well. And building on that, to, do, you, do you think a lot about how the NBA has expanded to other parts of the world outside of, of the North American continent and try to learn from those experiences, from those who have been leading the, um, the expansion in, in other parts? Ab absolutely. I mean, so... As a, um, the NBA has, as I said, uh, offices in uh, a number of different uh, regions uh, around the world, in China, in Latin America, Canada, uh, Europe, Asia. And so uh, we're in continuous conversation with colleagues there. Um, we're sharing initiatives. Um, we're uh, replicating um, uh, what we see work uh, in those markets, um, you know, and, and, and sometimes uh, listing, um, you know, almost wholesale uh, programs that we've seen be successful. And so mm. if I take an example in Asia, um, our team there has been very successful in uh, building partnerships with ministries of education. Uh, to introduce basketball into the school curriculum um, uh, as part of physical education and to uh, build a network of uh, 
teachers and and coaches to get uh, school children across uh, that uh, region to to play basketball. And so that's the, a program that we're looking to replicate uh, on the continent in order to broaden our reach uh, um, uh, uh, with young people. Um, you know, we, um, we've learned a lot from our colleagues in, in China as they've grown that business um, over um, several years into, you know, to be very successful. Um, and so we're looking at ways in which um, some of what they've done translates uh, into Africa. Um, we have a number of colleagues who've worked in various uh, other regions that are now part of the Africa team. So there's real fluid learning um, and uh, collaboration in order to, um, to, 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 to make the most of uh, the collective experience within the NBA. I have a question from what I can only imagine is, is a very, very big NBA fan. And the question is, when do you see an NBA game being played in Africa? We've played uh, what we call NBA Africa games um, on the continent uh, three times in the past uh, involving teams of NBA players. Uh, we stopped that during COVID. We're looking to resume that soon. Um, and yes, we will explore um, whether it makes sense to bring um, NBA teams uh, to the continent to play. That's a different proposition with a lot of, you know, yes, a lot of opportunity, but also a lot of complexity to it. Um, so, um, but uh, in general, we want to get soon to having NBA players play games on that. Yeah, we're very grateful to digital technologies that allow us to, to connect over continents, but we also see some of the challenges uh, unfold, unfold live. So Victor, I'd, I'd love to wrap up with one last question that actually refers both to your current role uh, as CEO of NBA Africa, as well as your previous experience across, across the continent. If you were to advise um, leaders, business leaders who are interested in expanding in Africa, in any industry, what would be some of the advice that you would give to them at this particular point in time? So first of all, I would say that the opportunity for, in Africa um, is, 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 is tremendous and continues to be a high potential. Africa, despite the times of the last few years, continues to have markets that are uh, growing at some of the fastest rate on the continent. Um, and I think especially when one thinks about the youth demographic, um, I think there's a statistic that, and I'm, you know, by 2050, 40% uh, of the world's youth will be African. Um, and so it is a market that cannot be ignored, especially for anyone that is looking to tap into that uh, global youth demographic. Second thing uh, I would say then is to have a long-term strategy for success um, on the continent um, and to be prepared to execute that strategy even you know, during periods of challenge, uh, which will happen uh, given uh, the current phase of African development. Third uh, point I'd make is it's important to commit to the continent to put people on the continent, uh, to you know, devote capital and resources, uh, and to really take the time to understand uh, the business environment and the markets on the continent, and to figure out um, uh, how uh, you want to execute your strategy. But, but commitment is important. And then the fourth thing I would say is be flexible. Uh, so, um, you know, Africa is not a straight line um, uh, up. Uh, there will be, uh, you know, uh, still a fair amount of volatility, but be willing and able to shift your strategy um, to, uh, to, 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 to take advantage of the changing circumstances while still being focused on your long-term goal in terms of where you want to get to. 
Victor, thank you so much. Thank you again for joining us this evening. While you were reconnecting, I had a chance to, to um, find out that it's almost uh, 11 p.m. for you in a Johannesburg, where you are based right now. So even you know, with that in mind, a double thank you for joining us at, uh, at the end of your day. Steve, back to you. Thank you again, Mr. Williams, for joining us today and sharing your insights with us. Thank you, Professor Dorabantu, for moderating this event. And thank you to all of our guests for joining us and for your questions. Before signing off, we would just like to invite everyone to come back for our next event. On April 11th, our next speaker will be Shannon K. O'Neill of the Council on Foreign Relations, who will join us for a fireside chat about her new book, The Globalization Myth, Why Regions Matter. Details and registration information are at stern.nyu.edu slash globalization speakers. Again, thank you all for joining us. Thank you to our speakers and have a great rest of the day. Goodbye. Thank you.